start the axial skeleton by looking at the skull. We'll see here an adult and then the fetal skull. So starting with the fetal skull, we'll see soft spots, also known as fontanelles. So the face looking at us here, this first fontanelle would be the anterior fontanelle. In the back where these bones come together would be a posterior fontanelle. Now looking at the side of the face over here, where these bones come together would be the anterolateral fontanelle and then posterior lateral fontanelle. So remember these fontanelles are soft spots or areas where these sutures haven't fused yet that allow for brain growth and will also allow for the skull to shape as it comes through the birth canal to allow for that passage. Now we look at the adult skull, we'll see that the sutures are fused now. And we'll see the one coming across the crown of the head up here will be the coronal uh, suture. The one dividing the two parietal bones back here, straight down the middle, the sagittal suture. And in the back, coming up almost like the lambda from the Greek alphabet, that would be the lambdoidal suture or lambdoid suture. On the side over here, separating the temporal bone, this would be the squamous suture, sometimes called the squamosal suture. Now if we look at the bones themselves along with the features, see all the way up front back to the coronal suture, this, all of this is the frontal bone facing the front. We mentioned earlier the parietal, right and left parietal bones. The back all the way going underneath the occipital bone. Then once again the temporal bones. We'll look at these features in just a moment. So the first feature to look at here on the frontal bone, we'll see the eye sockets, we'll call the orbits. And there is a small hole, sometimes broken through there. So that feature would be the supraorbital notch or supraorbital foramen. Supra meaning above the orbit. So supraorbital foramen means hole. So a small opening there for the passage of nerves. Between the two orbits we'll see the nasal bone just on the bridge of the nose up there. Below the orbits we have the maxilla or maxillary bone. It's feature under each of the orbits there's a hole. So the infra means below, so infraorbital foramen, one for each side where a nerve comes out to innervate, innervate this portion of the face. We have the mandible down here. We'll look at the features of that in just a moment. Now looking over here at the back of the skull for the occipital bone, we'll see foramen magnum. So big hole or hole big. Raised smooth areas on the bone are usually called a condyle. That's an articular surface. So here we'll have the occipital condyles. Now move to a skull with the mandible detached so that we can see the features underneath. So we see in the roof of the mouth, way at the back, we have the palatine bone. And then everything else, the extension, there's the palatine process. So remember the process is an extension of a bone. So if we look over here at the temporal bone, everything just beneath this suture, the external acoustic meatus or external auditory meatus, either one's okay. Uh, the bump behind the ear, which you can feel pretty easily, is the mastoid process. Underneath, a little spike hanging down here and here, or the styloid process. And then we'll have this depressed area here, usually filled with cartilage. The mandibular fossa. Remember that a fossa, you think move fossa and get depressed, so fossa is a depression. Now we can look at the features of the occipital bone. So the occipital bone, everything beneath here. So first of all, the foramen magnum. And then on either side of that, these raised smooth areas, the occipital condyles. Now we can look at the inside of the skull. So you're going to see that the face is going that way. So as we we'll look, this small area that's circled here, that is going to be the ethmoid bone. And the features here on either side of the ethmoid bone will be cribriform plate. And there's very small holes in there, the olfactory foramina. So the olfactory bulb will lie here in the cribriform plate, and the fibers will pass through the olfactory foramina into the nasal cavity so we can detect smells. Another feature here sticking up this little ridge is called the cristagalli. And the bottom part of the ethmoid bone down inside the nasal cavity, this top part of the septum here is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The bottom part of this septum is the vomer. 
All right, we'll see some other features in here that aren't necessarily associated with the ethmoid bone, but it's good to go ahead and look at them. So these ridges on the sides of the nasal cavity, down here the inferior nasal concha, just above that the middle nasal concha. On this model you can't see the superior nasal concha on up inside there a bit. All right, now coming back around here, below the ethmoid, or behind the ethmoid, we'll see this large bone back in here. Kind of looks like a moth or a bat sometimes. This is the sphenoid bone. Now the features, the first thing that you see, these ridges, is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. The greater wing is down below here. And we'll see that the greater wing is called that because it's much larger and comes out on the side and inside the orbits. All right, the other feature we see here, the holes, so that's the optic canal or the optic foramen. And we'll see that that allows for the optic nerve to pass through and come out of that orbit so that we can see. So one for each side there. There we go. And then back here behind that, this feature here, you see it's raised in the front, a little dip, and then raised in the back. This is the stella tersica. In Latin it means Turkish saddle. So later in the semester you'll see who's riding in the saddle here and why it's so important to keep it protected. Alright, so nothing else to see on the inside here at this point. There are many more things, but at this level that's all we need. But looking inside the orbits, there is a hole here, one on each side, that is for the lacrimal duct. And you see a suture that surrounds that area. That will be the lacrimal bone. Now we can look at the features of the mandible, the jawbone. You see going all the way around here, all of this is the body of the mandible. All right, we'll see what we mentioned earlier, these holes for the openings for nerves, the mental foramen, one for each side to innervate the, the jaw. Now when we get back here, there's the angled portion there, mandibular angle, very aptly named on both sides. And this flattened arm-like area is called a ramus. So this is the ramus of the mandible. And that leads up to these smooth rounded areas, the mandibular condyle, which will fit into the mandibular fossa to make up the temporomandibular joint. I have here the mandibular notch, both sides, leading up to the coronoid process for muscular attachment. Now here we have this U or horseshoe shaped bone. If you turn it up like this, it looks like vampire teeth. This is the hyoid bone. And all these little pieces have names that we're not going to worry about right now. This comes a little later. But remember, it attaches to no other bones. And it's just for muscular attachment. Now here you see the sternum and its costal cartilage that attaches to the ribs. Now the parts of the sternum, there's a little suture line that runs across here. So this top portion is called the manubrium. And its feature is the jugular notch. All through here will be the body of the sternum. And then the little point hanging down here, that feature, is the xiphoid process. Now we're familiar with the rib cage, and we know that the first seven ribs are true and all the others are false, including the floating ribs. But the main thing to notice here is to be able to identify the different shapes. We won't need to identify exactly which one they are by number, but you should know what is just called a rib and what is the first rib. The first rib has a kind of C shape, looks like a seahorse somewhat, so that would be the first rib, very flat. Look closer at the vertebrae, you see here that we have C1 and C2. You can tell these by looking at their shapes. Some deep divots here, and you see there's a little attachment point there. That is so C2 can fit up under here like this. So C1 is also the atlas. Remember the atlas is holding up your whole world there. C2 is the axis. So the head can turn on this axis. This is the DENS, D-E-N-S, or the odontoid process, if you really want to show off. They both mean the same thing. Now we can start to look at the vertebral column. And if you were to call the, start with cervical, thoracic, and on down to the lumbar, before we get down to the sacrum and then the coccyx down at the bottom. So remember that we have seven, 12, five, usually about five fused and about three coccygeal bones. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, seven, twelve, five. So now we can start getting to the specifics of which vertebra goes where. We'll see here we have an example from each of the three top sections, the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, and it's somewhat easy to tell. The cervical kind of has this smiley face hidden in there. So if you can see the eyes and the little smiley, so a smiley cervical. 
Another special feature, all of these have this feature, but this one on the cervical, on some of the cervical bones, a little different. So the spinous process on the cervical has two points to it. It's the bifid spinous process for muscular attachments to the head. And this one here will be the thoracic. And I always remember this one by thinking that it looks like a giraffe, somewhat. All right, we'll look at the features here in just a second. Then in lumbar, with a little imagination, you might be able to make out a moose head, like a big lumbering moose from the lumbar region. So to look at some of these features, we'll see again the spinous process that exists on all of these. And there will be no other features for now uh, from the cervical region. So we're just gonna focus on the thoracic and then the lumbar. You see these ears out here will be a transverse process for thoracic and lumbar. So transverse process there as well. Now this body here, and we'll see it's much larger in the lumbar, a lot more weight to support. So the body is much larger. So <clears throat> teaching myself these things, I always separate these in two, from the body and then everything else. So standing on the body, these portions of bone here are called the pedicles. Right? It's kind of like feet standing on there, and ped means foot, so they're pedicles. So our transverse process again. This little cheekbone area here, if you're looking at this as a moose face, will be the lamina. Same thing on thoracic, the lamina will exist here leading down to the spinous process. So to connect with the other bones, the horns on the giraffe, this will be the superior articulating process or superior articulating facet. If we turn this upside down, you could tell it's upside down by that spinous process, some smooth areas underneath here, inferior articulating process or inferior articulating facet. So looking back over towards this lumbar with the moose, the horns up here, would be the superior articulating process or facet, and the jowls hanging down would be the inferior articulating process or facet. So I have the vertebral foramen where the spinal cord lives, and a little vertebral arch here, and the same thing with thoracic with the vertebral foramen and the vertebral arch. So now we go to the appendicular skeleton, how it, it deals with the appendages, all those bones, and then the girdles that hold them on. So this girdle that helps to hold the arm on, we'll see the angel wings from the back, the scapula. All right, so some features to see there, the superior angle and the inferior angle. We have the spine of the scapula. It eventually becomes the acromion process. If we look at this side, we'll see the coracoid process. So if you remember from the mandible, we saw the coronoid process near the nose. Now we see the coracoid process near the clavicle. Now this indented area here where the humerus or the arm will fit in, that's the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. That's shaped bone here, the clavicle. And there's many different surfaces and names for all these bumps and whatnot, but we don't have to go over that just yet. That will come a little later in the education. And now we can see the humerus, the bone of the upper arm or the brachial region. So the rounded head here, so this is where we fit into that glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. If you're looking directly down at it like this, you'll see a couple of bumps. So this larger one here is the greater tubercle in a little valley, and then not quite as large, the lesser tubercle. Now as we move down the shaft of the bone here, there is a raised rough area in here. That would be the deltoid tuberosity. So the tubercles, tuberosities, these are muscular attachments. And later we'll see the trochanter, which will also have a different type of muscular attachment. Now we get down to the distal end of the humerus, and we'll see some raised smooth areas again, the condyles. But before we get there, large bump here and a smaller bump over here. So these are above the condyles, so these are epicondyles. Remember, epi means on top of or covering. So this is towards the inside of the arm. This will be the medial epicondyle, and over here, the lateral epicondyle. There's a small divot there, the coronoid fossa, on the back side, a much larger divot, the olecranon fossa. All right, so now looking at these articulating points, this larger portion here, the entire thing is the trochlea. And then kind of a skull cap looking portion here, very small, the capitulum. We'll move down towards the forearm. And the first one that we're gonna look at is the ulna. We know it's the ulna because it has the letter U here. 
And now this ulna will fit together with the humerus just like this. And that fit over the trochlea, so this U is the trochlear notch. This point sticks out here, the olecranon process fits in the olecranon fossa to allow for a full extension. And sticking up here, yet another coronoid process. And this coronoid process will fit into the coronoid fossa to allow for flexion. And moving on down the bone towards the distal end, we'll see a styloid process that will help stabilize the hand. Now we will see the radius, another bone of the forearm. I always thought of this as the soldier because you'll see the head has the crew cut here. And the head of the radius joins with the capitulum of the humerus. Bump here, radial tuberosity. As we continue mid down towards the distal end, we'll see another styloid process that's going to help stabilize the hand. And over towards the ulnar side, there is an indentation here, the ulnar notch. We can move on to the hand, and we can see how these styloid processes of the ulna and the radius can help stabilize the hand. All right, so once we've gotten down this far, we'll see multiple little bones here, the carpals. Remember, you drive a car with your hands, so carpals are here, tarsals are near the toes. And we need to know these carpals. And I like to use mnemonics, they've always helped me. So on the back row, we should have one, two, three, four bones. On the front row, one, two, three, four. So one of the better mnemonics is so long to pinky, here comes the thumb. So that's the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquitrum, the pisiform. We come back up here, we'll have the hamate. Big one in the middle, capitate the trapezoid, and then the trapezium is near the thumb. So you need to know it both ways. So again, so long to pinky, here comes the thumb. So scaphoid, lunate, triquitrum here, and then pisiform up here. This hook belongs to the hamate, so don't get those confused. Big capitate in the middle, trapezoid hiding in here, and then once again the trapezium is near the thumb. Now if we move from the carpals, each of these bones of the hand are the metacarpals. Always start with the thumb. So metacarpal one, two, three, four, five. Then all of these would be the knuckles essentially. So everything out here is a finger or a digit. I see there's only two for the thumb, but there's three for all of the others usually. All right, so that's gonna be a proximal and distal and then a proximal middle distal. So how we'll name these is using the names of those bones and then the number of the digit, always starting from the thumb. So this will be the proximal phalanx of the first digit, distal phalanx of the first digit. Here, proximal phalanx of the second digit, middle phalanx of the second digit, distal phalanx of the second digit, and so on from there. We continue with the appendicular skeleton and start to look at the pelvic girdle which holds the legs on. And what we see here is a coxal bone, these hip bones. And they're made of three fused bones. So this superior portion up here, the top, this is the ilium. The posterior surface back here, the ischium, all through here. And then all of this on the anterior portion, the pubis or pubic bone. All right, we know top from bottom, but it's also very important to know the features. We have to know the anterior and posterior. So this is the anterior surface. The posterior has a large divot. Right, so to start to name these features, this bump here would be the anterior superior iliac spine. We're right up to the top of the ilium. We get to the iliac crest, and then a bump right back in here, the posterior superior iliac spine. Right, so we come on back here, large divot, the greater sciatic notch. Now we're starting to get into the area of the ischium. So this bump here would be the ischial spine. And just below it, there's a little notch there, the lesser sciatic notch. So these are named so the trunks of that large sciatic nerve will come through there just like that. And very bumpy and raised back here, the ischial tuberosity. And then what will eventually form from the other coxal bone on the other side, this pubic symphysis will form here. Large opening here, the obturator foramen. And this is the lateral surface. So this hole here would be the acetabulum, and that is going to be the connection point 
for the femur, the leg bone. So now we can see the femur, the thigh bone. So this would be the upper portion, what fits into the acetabulum of the coxal bone there. And this will be the head. Now on the head there is this small divot there. That is the fovea capitis. And the head is going to be attached to the neck. That's a very large bump here and a smaller one over here. So you have a greater trochanter and then the lesser trochanter. So if we head down the shaft of the femur, if we roll it over, you'll see there's a ridge through here. That is the linea aspera. When we get down to the distal portion here, we'll have our condyles. So the larger side is on the same side as the head. So this would be the medial condyle. And then this would be the lateral condyle. Bottom of the femur, the distal portion, we have a heart-shaped bone. This is the patella, not the kneecap. So each portion will have a different name, but for now all we need to do is be able to identify this little heart-shaped bone as the patella. On to the lower leg, we'll see the large tibia and the smaller fibula. So if we pick the tibia up, we'll see these little guys sticking up here. These will be between the condyles where the femur sits on top of here. So we'll have a medial and lateral intercondylar tubercle or intercondylar eminence. Either one's okay. Little bumpy area here. The tibial tuberosity. And as we head down the shaft of the tibia, there's a bit of a ridge here. So that's the anterior crest or anterior border. And we'll see a little hook hanging down. So this is your ankle bone. And on the tibia, it's always going to be on the medial side. So that's the medial malleolus. So if we bring the fibula into play here. There we go. So this will be the head of the fibula. Down on this end, this will be the ankle bone on the outside of your leg, the lateral malleolus. And now we've made it to the foot. So the small bones that we're going to see here, these are the tarsals. Remember, carpals are in the hands that drive the car. The tarsals are near the toes. So I have a little mnemonic for these, starting at the back. Cute toddlers need M-I-L-C, milk. So the cute would be the calcaneus, the heel bone. Toddler is talus, talus, articulates with the tibia and the fibula. The needs, that's navicular, muscle attachments to navigate the foot. And then the M-I-L, so that's the medial, because it's on the medial side, the intermediate, and the lateral cuneiform, or cuneiform, however you want to pronounce it. The big cube out here is the cuboid. Then we get into our metatarsals. And we do this similar to the way we do the hands. Always start counting from the great toe side, the hallux. So metatarsal one, two, three, four, five. And we get down to the actual toes themselves, the digits. This is the exact same way we do the fingers. So you'll notice again, just two for the big toe and then three for the other toes usually. So the proximal phalanx of the first digit, distal phalanx of the first digit, proximal phalanx of the second digit, middle phalanx of the second digit, distal phalanx of the second digit, and so on from there.